Well, good morning, everyone. I'm glad to be with you. And just to make sure we got the technology working, you're seeing one slide. Let me know. You're seeing one slide that says relax and thank you. All right. Yes. <laughs> oh, my, how I wish I was in the Sacred Valley, too. If you haven't been to that part of Peru, it is amazing. So, yeah, sit back, relax. Thank you for inviting me. And let's have the first part of a metaphysical romp. And as always, I, since there may be new people, I like to remind people of my email address, alberthasselbeck at gmail.com. Please feel free to email me. My website is paulhasselbeck.com. And then you can find my podcast at metaphysicalromp2.com that I do with the Reverend Doctors Bill and Cher Holton. So today, first part is what's up with that and as always you know where i'm probably going to start unanswered questions are far less dangerous than unquestioned answers so today we will be questioning some of the answers most of us have been taught during our time in the uni movement so from the gospel of thomas saying number two jesus said let him who seeks continue seeking until he finds. When he finds, he will become troubled. So if you're a little troubled by what you hear today, that's good news. When he becomes troubled, he will become astonished and he will rule over all. And so Myrtle Fillmore's primary definition of God was God is it neither male nor female, but principle. Charles Fillmore chimed in too. He said, by the term mind, we mean God, the universal principle, which includes all principles. And so in this one quote, we have mind equals God equals principle, three synonyms. And then we're going to add another. Yet there is but one I am. We've all heard about the I am. It cannot be cut into parts. It is principle. So we just learned something else about principle. There's never a drop of it, a piece of it, or a wave of it. It is always present in its entirety at every point in space, all at the same time, said Eric Butterworth. Now, we might be only aware of a drop or a wave or a piece, but it's right there in its entirety. And then the I am is the metaphysical name of the spiritual self as distinguished from the human self. So we are fully divine and fully human. And knowing this and continually remembering this is important to prosperity. So we have mind equals God equals principle. We have principle equals the I am. We have I am equals my spiritual self. And then my spiritual self equals principle, God, mind. Now, when Charles called the I am our spiritual self, we think it's a self like our human self. Well, it isn't because our human self changes, but our spiritual self doesn't. It is immutable, unchangeable, always is fully present. So let's look at principle. What is principle? Well, according to Merriam-Webster, it's an underlying faculty or endowment. And that's the primary definition I'd like you to keep in mind for principle. Now, you might ask, maybe you know somewhere that Charles said God is law. Well, our founders were brilliant and confounding when they called God principle and God is law, until you know from Merriam-Webster that principle is also defined as a comprehensive and fundamental law. This adds to our confusion. It produces lack of clarity. And then we have the five basic principles that Connie Fillmore exposed, but those aren't principles. <laughs> Those are more like premises. And so 
we have human laws and rules. And so when we think of spiritual laws, we think they're like human laws, but they're not. Because you see, human laws are really rules. Rules can be broken. Rules can be changed. Rules, you can follow them or not follow them. Spiritual law isn't like that. So there are spiritual laws and natural laws. And I put them all in the same basket if they're unchangeable and immutable. So one of the ways Charles defined law is God as law is principle in action. Well, you know, I've known that def definition for years. But until I started to dig in and do the research on the book on principles and premises, and as I continue to write the book on laws and rules, I finally figured this out. So if you think of the law of mind action, thoughts held in mind with feeling produce after their kind with feeling. And a, a thought and feeling held in my mind produces more thoughts and feelings in my mind. Well, in order to hold a thought in mind, we have to desire it. And desire is part of the definition of the principle of love. And so that just gives you one small example how the law of mind action operates using the principle of love. And so this proved that laws depend on principle and use principle. And for me, spiritual laws tell me, tell you, tell us how mind works. Thoughts held in mind with feeling produce more thoughts with feeling in the same mind. That's how your mind works. And when we know that, we can use it consciously. Because before we know that, we're using the law, but unconsciously. And then similarly, natural law tell us, inform us how physical things work, all the way down to the quantum level. Spiritual laws and natural laws are exact. And Charles said in Jesus Christ Heals, the laws of mind are just as exact and undeviating as the laws of mathematics and music. So now you can see why I put spiritual laws and natural laws in the same basket. I've already said they're unbreakable and they're unchangeable and they're always in play. Spiritual law and natural laws are always in play. You can't avoid them. So now let's start looking at some of these. And, and I began doing this in my quest to question my unquestioned answers. And I also was looking at the unity movement, at unity churches, at individuals. And I was noticing that we have a lot to say about principles. We have a lot to say about law. We have a lot to say about prosperity. But yet many unity churches, unity organizations, and individuals aren't being prosperous. Now, that's puzzling to me. And so as I began to think about that and dig into it, I found out that maybe the problem isn't that people aren't or organizations aren't applying the principles and laws of prosperity correctly, that they're doing erroneously and getting erroneous results, maybe we didn't understand them. And maybe we need to question some of Charles Fillmore's answers. And so here we go. While I, uh, I have to mute Alexa. Alexa, thank you. <laughs> the Alexa, turn off the alarm. <laughs> and how many out there did your Alexa go off? <laughs> okay, so Charles talks about 
the law of supply being a divine law. And he goes on to say, this means that is a law of mind that must work through mind. Okay, so there's two things on here I want to look at. So when we're talking about divine law or spiritual law, we're talking about the laws of mind. Divine mind doesn't need laws. Divine mind is law and principle. Our little m mind that's changeable definitely needs laws. And so when we speak of spiritual law or divine law, you hear it anywhere. Think a law that tells me how my mind works. Okay. So Charles said the law of supply is a divine law. So this is the first law we're going to question. But wait, divine substance is man's supply, according to Charles Fillmore. Supply is spiritual substance, according to Charles Fillmore. And substance is the divine idea of all the underlying reality of all things. Everything that exists, everything that changes, whether it's thought and feelings or whether it's something physical, must have a divine idea underlying them. And a divine idea is a synonym for principle. So when Charles said there's a, a law of supply, he's calling it a law of principle, but principle isn't a law. Supply is not a law. Supply is a principle and a very important one because it's a word that refers to every principle or every, every divine idea that makes up the universal principle that God is. Supply simply is friends and saying the law of supply doesn't tell us how to use the supply in our minds. So now let's look at another law, the law of giving and receiving. And I know for some of you, I'm stepping into sacred cow territory. The law of giving and receiving. The way we've taught it is giving and receiving are inseparable. But does one truly cause the other? Or do giving and receiving happen frequently together? That that Does that mean one must follow the other? I don't think so. Let's also invest a minute or two looking at the law of giving and receiving in consciousness versus in the physical world. So if I were there and I gave you this pen in the physical world, I would now have less pen and you would have more pen. I would have less pen, you would have more pen. So in the physical world, when I give you a physical thing, I now have less of that physical thing. Now in consciousness, Giving and receiving are different. I'm giving you from my consciousness, my, uh, my thoughts, my feelings on prosperity that are totally in my opinion, okay? And I, I give you my thoughts and feelings. You can decide to take them in and receive them or not. However, as I share this lesson on prosperity with you, I can give you all that I know about prosperity and I don't have less prosperity. I don't have less of the teachings. I don't have less principle. I don't have less law. If you choose to accept them and believe them, now you have more of them in your consciousness. And remember, I talked about the law of mind action earlier. When I'm giving in consciousness, what I'm giving out in consciousness is now reinforced in my consciousness and grows in my consciousness. So you see, 
the way giving and receiving works in consciousness is very different than the physical world. So what if giving and receiving are not tied together, but are two separate acts? That giving is one thing in the physical world, in the outer world, and receiving is a separate thing. And I think the problem that we've had with giving and receiving is we always connect them together. And that makes them a kind of business transaction. That in our world, in our cultures, when I give you something, it puts you in obligation to give something back to me. That I receive something from you. That's a business transaction. And if I'm on the receiving end and you give me something, I feel obligated to give you something back. So in both of those instances, in the giving, I set up an obligation to receive and return. And in receiving, there's an obligation set up for me to give back. It, it's the same, the same instant, but I really want to make this clear that we want to reach a point where our giving is free and clear of any sense of a business transaction. That when I give, I give because I can, not because I'm expecting something back, pressed down, flowing over, all of those things we hear about in the Bible. And it's really interesting about that quote, about getting back, pressed down, flowing over, is in the conversation about consciousness, not about things. And I already said, whatever I give in consciousness, I'm receiving it at the same time. So giving and receiving is different in consciousness. And so they're not a business transaction. We don't want to give with the sense of, I'm going to get something back. And receiving, I don't want to, in my receiving, think I have to give something back. So then what would be the principles underlying this law of giving and receiving? Well, in the giving part, we have generosity and benevolence. And in all of my research, I couldn't even find a principle named generosity. And so with consultation with some of my friends, we've added generosity to the list found in all of the published writings of Charles and Mil Mortar, Myrtle Fillmore. There isn't a principle found in the historic writings for receiving. So again, in consultation with, with friends and students, we've decided there must be a principle of receptivity, receptivity. And when that is used er erroneously, it becomes taking, it becomes taking. So in the law of giving and receiving, where giving is separate from receiving, there are two separate things. There's these pr three principles, generosity, bene benevolence, and receptivity. And look, friends, if this were a law, if giving and receiving was a law where the giving and the receiving are absolutely always connected with each other, we could not have the choice not to receive. But I could give you this pen and you could decide not to accept, accept it. And if it were a law, then if I accept it, the pen, then I have to give you something back. If it was a law, it had to happen. There would be no thinking about it. But when we make giving and receiving a law and keep them separate, then the idea of law works. 
Okay, so some of you might be thinking about, well, Paul, what about the law of circulation? What about the law of circulation? Well, it's obvious things circulate. So for example, animals exhale carbon di dioxide and plants absorb carbon dioxide and give out oxygen. So there, are, there is circulation going on, but is it a law or is it a principle? Is it a law or is it a principle? Well, I probably think principle, I think it's a principle because it's more like a fact or a faculty. Okay, now we're going to address a bigger sacred cow, the law of tithing, the law of tithing that simply says we should give 10% well, first of all, is it a law or a rule? So you knew I was going there. We give 10% of what we have received to where we've been spiritually fed. Well, give to where you are spiritually fed? Well, that sets us up with a little problem. And I've seen it in multiple churches. If we have, if we have tied, the law of tithing to where we're spiritually fed, then when I'm in the process of giving to my church, I have to first evaluate, have I been spiritually fed? And if I haven't been spiritually fed, I can choose not to give. I don't like that much, friends. And then there are some teachers going around that say, if you don't give, God will take it from you through unexpected expenses. Yeah, that sounds like punishment to me and sounds like the God of my childhood. If you don't give, God will take it from you through unexpected expenses. Huh couple problems with this but those expenses are not associated with being spiritually fed are they so if god can take it from us through unexpected expenses an example i often hear when i'm traveling around i didn't give my tithe this month and guess what my car broke down and guess how much the bill was? Exactly what my tithe was supposed to be. Well, that's connecting two unrelated events. But if you want to go with this, and if God is happy accepting his tithe, his, because this is about a traditional God, by you giving money to the auto mechanic, then why can't we give our tithe to anyone we want. We're fully divine and we're fully human. Here's another thing. If God can take it from you, then why give at all if God can take it away anyway? It would be automatic. It would be like the law of tithing is saying that God can do an automatic withdrawal from your bank account. I don't like this, and I'm sure you're not surprised. So it's not a law, but is it a rule? Well, it gives us training wheels on how to give or that we should give. And you know what? It sets up a practice of giving. And friends, giving is what it's all about. Now, receiving is important. Receiving with that sense of obligation is important. Giving of what we have received, where you get to determine how much you give. 
doesn't have to be 10%. It can be 2%, whatever you're comfortable with. But friends, do keep giving to your churches. Not because you're obligated to, but because you can give. And because you love your churches, you love your spiritual communities. And from your inner knower, knower, if you're feeling like you want to give to a charity, give to a charity. Often in unity, you're here that's being talked about as giving to lack. No, I don't think so. It's giving because I want to help other people. And because I can. Because I can be generous. You can be generous. You can be benevolent. And you can be receptive. When someone gives you something, say thank you. Thank you. With no need to give back. Be in the flow of giving and receiving being separate. Get into the practice of giving. And I'm sure many of you already have. So hopefully today you're going away knowing what a principle is. It's a faculty. Think of the 12 powers or a fact. And what a law is. A law tells you how things work. A spiritual law tells you how your consciousness works. A natural law tells you how the physical world works. And so next week in Prosperity Part 2, we're going to be doing just the fundamentals, man. Now, look, we've already done some fundamentals, and these are going to be both building on each other so that when you're done with the three, you'll come away with a whole thing and more confidence of how to be abundant in every area of your life. Thank you for listening. All right, so I invite each of you now to take a few deep breaths, especially if you've been troubled by some of the things I've said. Remember, being troubled is not a bad thing. It sets us up to look deeper. And so as we take these deep breaths and let them out, I invite you to keep your eyes open, or maybe you want to close your eyes. I close my eyes to shut out what's coming in, the information that's coming in from the outer to the inner, because I want to pivot and be focused more closely, more keenly on my innate divinity. <sighs> yes, each of us is fully divine and fully human. We are identical in our divinity. Because the divine is everywhere present in its entirety at every point, all at the same time. There's no absence of presence anywhere. And there is never, ever just a piece or a part or a wave of the divine. You are fully divine and fully human. At every 37.2 trillion of your cells. And somehow, some way, each of us, you are, I am, we are manifesting our wondrous and distinct humanity using the principle and law that the divine is. In our divinity, we are identical. In our humanity, we are unique. And each of us 
expresses our humanity uniquely according to the condition and the levels and the quality of our mind or consciousness. So let us take this idea. Let's invest this time with the idea of I am fully divine and fully human as we rest in the silence. The divine is the universal principle which contains all principles, including the principle of generosity, benevolence, and receptivity. To yourself or out loud, repeat after me. I am generosity. Therefore, I am generous. I am benevolence. Therefore, I am benevolent. I am receptivity. Therefore, I am receptive. I am fully divine and fully human. And so you are, and so I am, and so it is. Amen. I am so blessed. I am so blessed. I am so grateful. Thank you, thank you, thank you for, well, I would call this a liberating uh, lesson that you shared, uh, Reverend Paul. Uh, they are sacred cows, and 
you know, most of us probably at one time or another questioned them and then sometimes fell into the dogma of following them. And so I feel, I feel that freedom beginning to um, share, shed light, which enables us now to contemplate all of that within our own lives and within our spiritual communities. So I'm absolutely grateful for, for your share, for the inquisitive, curious mind that you have that enables you to question and share. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And that leads us into our own flow of prosperity. And as Reverend Paul said, we give because we can. We give because we love. We give because we love our community. We love the uh, wisdom that we gain from being part of a community and the connection that we feel as being part of a community. And so I welcome each of you to just feel into the abundance that you already are, to the prosperity that you already are, and gratefully receive your contribution, your gift to maintaining Unity Spiritual Center Ottawa and Unity Kitchener with the generosity of your financial prosperity. And so let us know together uh, divine love as me blesses, I'm having a hard time seeing this, blesses and multiplies all that I give, all that I have, and all that I receive, and I am grateful. And I'm going to suggest we say that again and really feel it into the core of our being. Divine love, as me, blesses and multiplies all that I give, all that I have, and all that I receive, and I am grateful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And so this service cannot occur without the generosity of everyone uh, that has played a role, that have given their time and talent to uplift us this Sunday. And I'm grateful to each of you for saying yes and for being present. We welcome your feedback on the service today. So please send your comments to the office at officeunityottawa at yahoo.ca. And I, I want to extend a real thank you to Cheryl, as this is her first, uh, her debut appearance as our Sunday service coordinator. And well done, Cheryl. And you've navigated quite a few things this morning, and we're delighted, absolutely delighted to have you on board. So next week, March 13th, we have Reverend Paul back, as he said at the close of his lesson, to talk about the second step of prosperity, just the fundamentals. And I know that you'll all be back to receive that knowledge and opportunity to grow. So in closing, we bring, as we bring our service to a close, I invite you to explore at least one of the insights that spoke to you today and go in beauty, go in peace, go in grace. As our prayer partner for the week, Ontario shares the prayer of protection and she will be followed by an uplifting music video and fellowship. Welcome, Anne. Thank you, Linda. As you move into your day, May you feel inspired and uplifted to do what is yours to do this day, guided by the living, loving energy of God within you and all around you as you shine your light into the world as an inseparable part of the world. As we come together and close the service, let us pray holding our prayer request and join me in saying the prayer of protection. The light of God surrounds us. I am the light. The love of God enfolds us. I am the love. The power of God protects us. I am the power. The presence of God watches over us. I am the presence. Wherever we are, God is and all is well. We give thanks and appreciation for this time together and the reflections of our service. We go knowing that where we go, God is peace is. Go in peace, go in love.